Hi folks, welcome to RJ Impact. Today we're going to be doing a deep dive into a series of murders that was committed by an unknown man who came to be known as the Zodiac Killer. The case has been described as the most famous unsolved murder case in American history. Numerous movies, documentaries, mockumentaries, etc. have been made about it over the years and large resources by the FBI, local police departments and amateur sleuths have been thrown into solving it. The Zodiac murdered five known victims in the San Francisco Bay Area between December 1968 and October 1969. He targeted young couples and a lone male cab driver. Two of his attempted victims survived. The Zodiac himself claimed to have murdered 37 victims and he's been linked to several other cold cases in and around the San Francisco area. Let's go back in time to December the 20th, 1968. Two high school students, Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday, were on their first date and had planned to attend a Christmas concert at Hogan High School. They first visited a friend before stopping at a local restaurant and then driving out on Lake Herman Road and then onto a short gravel track known as being a lover's lane. They parked up. Shortly after 11pm, their bodies were found by Stella Borges. Who lived nearby. Utilising the available forensic data, the following chain of events are surmised to have happened. Shortly after the couple parked up, another car pulled onto the track just prior to 11pm. A man then walked up to the couple, still in Faraday's mother's rambler. He ordered the couple out and Jensen had exited first but when Faraday was halfway out, the killer shot him in the head. The killer then shot Jensen five times in the back as she fled. Her body was found 28 feet from the car. The killer then drove off. The Solano County Sheriff's Department investigated the crimes, but no leads were forthcoming. If we roll forward about six months to the night of July the 4th, 1969, Darlene Ferring and Michael Magoo drove into the Blue Rock Springs Park, four miles from the Lake Herman Road murder site. While the couple sat in Ferring's car, a second driver drove into the lot and parked alongside them, but almost immediately drove away. Returning about 10 minutes later, this second car then parked behind them. The driver of the second car exited the vehicle, approaching the passenger side door of Ferrin's car, carrying a flashlight and a 9mm Luger. The killer directed the flashlight into Megu's and Ferrin's eyes before shooting at them, firing five times. Both victims were hit and several bullets had actually passed through Megu and into Ferrin. The killer walked away from the car, but on hearing Megu's moaning, returned and shot each victim twice more before driving off. We then had what is considered the first recorded interaction with the killer, when the next day at 12.40am in the morning, a man phoned the Vallejo Police Department to report and claim responsibility for the attack. The caller took credit for the murders of Jensen and Faraday also. This call was traced to a phone booth at a gas station at Springs Road which was located about three tenths of a mile from Ferrin's home. I want to report a double murder. If you will go one mile east. On Columbus Parkway to the public park, you will find the kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Ferrin was pronounced dead at the hospital, however Megu survived the attack despite being shot in the face, neck and chest. We therefore got our first description of the killer when Megu described him as a 26 to 30 year old, 195 to 200 pound, 5 foot, 8 inch, white male with short, light brown curly hair. On August the 1st 1969, three letters prepared by the killer were received at the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle and the San Francisco Examiner. The writer took credit for the shootings at Lake Herman Road and the Blue Rock Springs, and each letter also included one third of a 408 symbol cryptogram, which the killer claimed contained his identity. There was demand for the cryptogram to be published on the front page of the papers, else the killer would kill up to a dozen people over the weekend. The Chronicle published its third of the cryptogram on page four of the next day's edition, and eventually all three parts were published.
On August the 7th, 1969, another letter was received out to the examiner. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. This was the first time the killer had used this name for his identification. The Zodiac included details about the murders that had not yet been released to the public, which proved it to be him as well as a message to the police that when they crack his code, they will have me. On August the 8th, 1969, Donald and Betty Harden of Salinas, California, cracked the 408 symbol cryptogram. It contained a misspelled message in which the killer seemed to reference the most dangerous game. The author also said that he was collecting slaves for his afterlife. No name appears in this decoded text. This is what it said. I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die I will be reborn in paradise and all the I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. And then there was a whole series of letters, E, B, E, O, R, I, E, T, etc. as you can see here. Now the meaning of these last 18 letters has never been established. On September the 27th, 1969, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepherd, two students, were picnicking off Lake Berryessa. A white man, about 5 feet 11 inches tall and approximately 170 pounds, approached them wearing a black executioner's type hood with clip-on sunglasses over the eye holes and a bib-like device on his chest that had a white 3 by 3 inch cross circle symbol on it. He approached them with a gun, thought to be a 45. The hooded man claimed to be an escaped convict and had killed a guard and subsequently stolen a car, explaining that he now needed their car and money to travel to Mexico because the vehicle that he'd been driving was too hot. The killer had bought pre-cut lengths of plastic clothesline and told Shepard to tie up Hartnell before he tied her up. The killer then checked and tightened Hartnell's bonds after discovering that Shepard had bound Hartnell's hands loosely. Hartnell initially believed this event to be a bizarre robbery, but the man drew a knife and stabbed them both repeatedly in the back, Hartnell suffering six and Shepard ten wounds in the process. The killer then hiked the 500 yards back up to the Knoxville Road, drew the cross circle symbol on Hartnell's car door with a black felt tip pen and wrote beneath it the following, Vallejo. 20 12 68 7 4 69 September 27 69 6 30 by knife. At 7 40 pm, the killer called the Napa County Sheriff's Office from a payphone to report his latest crime. He stated to the operator that he wished to report a murder, no, a double murder, before stating that he had been the perpetrator of the crime. I want to report a murder, no, a double murder. They are two miles north of Park Headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen gear. I'm the one that did it. Now the phone was found still off the hook minutes later on Main Street, Napa by KVON radio reporter Pat Stanley. This was only a few blocks from the sheriff's office yet 27 miles from the crime scene. Detectives were able to lift a still wet palm print from the telephone but were never able to match it to any suspect. After hearing the victims screams for help, a man and his son who were fishing in a nearby cove discovered the victims and summoned help by contacting park rangers. Napa County Sheriff's deputies arrived at the crime scene and Shepard was conscious when they arrived, providing them with a detailed description of the attacker. Shepard lapsed into a coma during transport and never regained consciousness, dying two days later. But Hartnell survived to recount his tale to the press. On October the 11th, 1969, a white male passenger entered the cab driven by Paul Stein at the intersection of Mason and Geary Streets in San Francisco, requesting to be driven to Washington and Maple Street. Stein drove one block past Maple to Cherry Street, and the passenger then shot Stein once in the head with a 9mm handgun. 
He took Stein's wallet and car keys and tore away a section of his blood-stained shirt tail. The perpetrator was observed by three teenagers across the street at 9.55pm and they phoned the police while the crime was actually still in progress. They observed a man wiping the cab down before walking away towards the Presido, one block to the north. Two blocks from the crime scene, patrol officers Dan Fogue and Eric Zelmus responding to the call frustratingly observed a white man walking along the sidewalk east on Jackson Street and stepping onto a stairway leading up to the front yard of one of the homes to the north side of the street. The encounter lasted 5 to 10 seconds. Fook estimated the white male pedestrian to be 35 to 45 years old, 5 foot 10 inches tall, with a crew cut, similar to but slightly older than the description provided by the teenagers who observed the killer in and out of Stein's cab. Teenagers described the suspect to be 25 to 30 years old with a crew cut and standing approximately 5 feet 8 inches to 5 feet 9 inches tall. However, the police radio dispatcher had alerted officers to look out for a black suspect, so Fook and Zolms drove past the perpetrator without stopping. The mix-up in descriptions remains unexplained to this day. A search ensued, but no suspects were found, and this was the last officially confirmed murder by the Zodiac Killer. The Stein murder was initially believed to be a routine robbery that had escalated into homicidal violence. However, on October the 13th, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter from Zodiac that had claimed credit for the killing and contained a torn section of Stein's bloody shirt to prove this fact. The three teen witnesses worked with a police artist to prepare a composite sketch of Stein's killer and a few days later this police artist returned working with the witnesses to prepare a second composite sketch. This has always been known as a city of mystery, and it seems now to have a new and real one on its hands. Five murders, and somebody who says he committed all and will commit yet more. The so goes on in team. San Francisco for the man known as the Zodiac Killer. On October the 14th, 1969, the Chronicle received another letter from the Zodiac, this time containing a swatch of Paul Stein's shirt tail as proof he was the killer. It also included a threat about killing school children on a school bus. To do this, Zodiac wrote, just shoot out the front tyre and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. At 2pm on October the 20th, 1969, somebody claiming to be the Zodiac called the Oakland Police Department demanding that one of two prominent lawyers, F. Lee Bailey or Melvin Belly, appear on AM San Francisco. This was a talk show on KGO TV hosted by Jim Dunbar. Bailey wasn't available but Belly did appear on the show. Dunbar appealed to the viewers to keep the lines open. Someone claiming to be the Zodiac called several times and Belly asked the caller for a less ominous name and the caller picked the name Sam. The caller said he would not reveal his true identity as he was afraid of being sent to the gas chamber. Belly arranged a rendezvous to meet the caller outside a shop on Mission Street in Daly City but no one arrived. I have headache. Right. How long have you had those headaches, Sam? In a long time? Since I killed a kid. If it all boils down to the question of you're giving yourself up, if you could be assured that you wouldn't get capital punishment for my I don't son. Want to give myself I, up. Huh? I want to kill those kids. The call was later traced back to be a patient in a mental institution, and investigators concluded that the man was not the Zodiac. On November the 8th, 1969, the Zodiac mailed a card with another cryptogram consisting of 340 characters. This cipher, dubbed Z340, remained unsolved for over 51 years. On December the 5th, 2020, it was deciphered by an international team of private citizens, including American software engineer Dave Oranchak, Australian mathematician Sam Blake, and Belgian programmer Jol van Eyck. In the deciphered message, the Zodiac denied being the Sam, who spoke out on the AM San Francisco, explaining that he was not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner. The team submitted their findings to the Federal Bureau of Investigation 
which verified the discovery. The FBI stated that the decoded message gave no further clues to the identity of the Zodiac. On November the 9th, 1969, the Zodiac mailed a seven-page letter stating that two policemen stopped and actually spoke with him three minutes after he shot Stein. Extracts from the letter were published in the Chronicle on November the 12th, including the Zodiac's claim that same day, Officer Don Folk wrote a memo explaining what happened on the night of Stein's murder. On December the 20th, 1969, exactly one year after the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, the Zodiac mailed a letter to Belly that included another swatch of Stein's shirt. The Zodiac said that he wanted Belly to help him. A number of other murders have actually been speculatively connected with the Zodiac, and a few of these are Robert George Domingos, 18, and Linda Faye Edwards, 17, who were shot and killed on June the 4th, 1963, on a beach near Gaviota. There were some specific similarities between their attack and the Zodiac's attack at Lake Berryessa six years later. Cherry Joe Bates, who was 18, was stabbed to death and nearly decapitated on October the 30th, 1966, at Riverside City College. Bates' possible connection to the Zodiac only appeared four years after her murder, when the Chronicle reporter Paul Avery received a tip regarding similarities between the Zodiac killings and the circumstances surrounding Bates' death. Guthling Johns, 22, was allegedly abducted on March the 22nd, 1970 on Highway 132 near the I-580 in an area west of Modesto. Johns escaped from the car of a man who drove her and her infant daughter around the area between Stockton and Patterson for approximately one to one and a half hours. Let's give you a little bit more background on this particular case. On the night of March the 2nd, 1970, Kathleen Johns was driving from San Bernardino to Petaluma to visit her mother. She was seven months pregnant and had her 10-month-old daughter beside her in the car. While heading west on Highway 132 near Modesto, a car behind her began honking its horn and flashing its headlights. She pulled off the road and stopped. It was late at night. I had left in the evening and the car behind me started flashing its lights, bright and dim, bright and dim. And the car pulled up behind me and this guy got out and he um, said that my back wheel was wobbly. The man in the car parked behind her, approached her car and stated that he observed that her right rear wheel was wobbling and offered to tighten the lug nuts. After finishing his work, the man drove off. Yet, when Johns pulled forward to re-enter the highway, the wheel almost immediately came off the car. I was just moving slow and it just dropped down and, you know, the tire fell off. The man returned, offering to drive her to the nearest gas station for help. He went back and looked at it and said he guessed the lug nuts were stripped or something like that. And, um, He'd give me a ride to a gas station to get it fixed. And she and her daughter climbed into his car. During the ride, the car passed several service stations, but the man didn't stop. For about 90 minutes, he drove back and forth around the back roads near Tracy. When Johns asked why he was not stopping, he'd changed the subject. Now, when the driver finally stopped at an intersection, Johns jumped out with her daughter and hid in a field. He appeared to be almost trance-like. I believed him when he said I was going to die, he was going to kill me. Don't panic, don't scream, don't yell. Just wait and see what happens. You know, he could have stopped at any time and physically been stronger than I was. I was like seven months pregnant and I had a little kid on my lap. When we would come to any kind of stop sign, he would slow down, but he didn't stop. So I jumped finally. The driver actually searched for her using a flashlight, telling her that he wouldn't hurt her before eventually giving up. Unable to find her, he got back into the car and drove off. Johns hitched a ride to the police station in Patterson. Now, when Johns gave her statement to the sergeant on duty, she noticed a police composite sketch of Paul Stein's killer and recognised him as the man who had abducted her and her child. I looked up on the wall and there was one of those composite drawings of the person I just spent this time with. It turns out it was the Zodiac. And I didn't know who that was at the time, it meant nothing to me. Fearing that he might return to kill them all, the sergeant had Johns wait in the dark at a nearby Mills restaurant, and when her car was found, it had been gutted and torched. (laughs) 
The Zodiac continued to communicate with the authorities for the remainder of 1970s via letters and greeting cards to the press. In a letter postmarked April the 20th, 1970, the Zodiac wrote, My name is, and then this was followed by a 13-character cipher that hasn't been solved to this day. The Zodiac went on to state that he was not responsible for the recent bombing of a police station in San Francisco, but added, There's more glory to killing a cop than a kid, spelt C-I-D, because a cop can shoot back. This letter included a diagram of a bomb the Zodiac claimed he would use to blow up a school bus. At the bottom of the diagram, he wrote, This symbol equals 10, comma, SFPD equals 0. Zodiac sent a greeting card postmarked 28th of April 1970 to the Chronicle. Written on the card was, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast, followed by the Zodiac's cross circle signature, and blast was in all capitals. On the back of the card, the Zodiac threatened to use the bus bomb soon unless the newspaper published the full details that he had written. He also wanted to start seeing people wearing some nice Zodiac buttons. In a letter postmarked June the 26th, 1970, the Zodiac stated that he was upset that he did not see people wearing Zodiac buttons. He wrote, I shot a man sitting in a parked car with a 38. The Zodiac was possibly referring to the murder of 25-year-old Sergeant Richard Raditic one week earlier. On June the 19th, Raditic was writing a parking ticket in his squad car when an assailant unrelated to the traffic violation shot him in the head with a 38 caliber pistol through the closed driver's side window. Raditic died 15 hours later. The San Francisco Police Department denied that this was the Zodiac and the murder remains unsolved. Included with this letter was a Phillips 66 roadmap of the San Francisco Bay Area. On the image of Mount Diablo, the Zodiac had drawn a cross circle similar to those from previous correspondence. At the top of the cross circle, he placed a zero, a three, six, and a nine. The accompanying instructions stated that zero was to be sent to Magnetic North. The letter also included a 32-letter cipher that the killer claimed would, in conjunction with the code, lead to the location of a bomb he had buried and set to detonate in the fall. The cipher was never decoded and the alleged bomb was never located. The killer signed off the note with this symbol 12 SFPD 0. In a letter to the Chronicle postmarked July the 24th 1970, the Zodiac took credit for Kathleen John's abduction four months after the incident. In a July 26th 1970 letter, the Zodiac paraphrased a song from the Mikado adding his own lyrics about making a little list of the ways in which he planned to torture his slaves in paradise. The letter was signed with a large exaggerated cross circle symbol and a new score symbol 13 SFPD 0. A final note at the bottom of the letter stated PS the Mount Diablo code concerns radians plus number of inches along the radians. In 1981, a close examination of the radian hint by Zodiac researcher Gareth Penn led to the discovery that a radian angle, when placed over the road map per Zodiac's instructions, pointed to the locations of two Zodiac attacks. Zodiac remained silent for another nearly three years. The Chronicle then received a letter from the Zodiac, postmarked January 29, 1974, praising The Exorcist as the best satirical comedy that I have ever seen. The letter included a snippet of verse from the Mikado and an unusual symbol at the bottom that has remained unexplained by researchers. Zodiac concluded the letter with a new score, Me 37 SFPD 0. Over the years, a large number of people have come under suspicion as suspects. Before we get to who is generally considered to be the main suspect, we'll go through some of the less likely candidates as the perpetrator. Lawrence Kay Kathleen Johns, who claimed to have been abducted by the Zodiac Killer, picked out Kane, who later called himself Kay, in a photo lineup. 
patrol officer Don Folk, who possibly observed the Zodiac Killer following the murder of Paul Stein, said that Kane closely resembled the man he and Eric Zolms encountered. Kane worked at the same Nevada hotel as possible Zodiac victim Donna Lass. Kane was diagnosed with impulse control disorder after suffering brain injuries in a 1962 accident. He was arrested for voyeurism and prowling. In 2007, Dennis Kaufman claimed that his stepfather, Jack Terrence, was Zodiac. Kaufman turned several items over to the FBI, including a hood similar to the one worn by the Zodiac. According to news sources, DNA analysis conducted by the FBI on the items was deemed inconclusive in 2010. In 2009, former lawyer Robert Tarbox, who was disbarred in August 1975 by the California Supreme Court for failure to pay some clients, said that in the early 1970s, a merchant mariner walked into his office and confessed to him that he was the Zodiac Killer. The seemingly lucid seaman, whose name Tarbox would not reveal, based on confidentiality, described his crimes briefly but persuasively enough to convince Tarbox. The man said he was trying to stop himself from his opportunistic murder spree but never returned to see Tarbox again. Tarbox took out a full page ad in the Vallejo Times Herald that claimed it would clear the name of Arthur Lee Allen as killer. We'll come back to Allen later and apparently this was Tarbox's only reason for revealing the story 30 years after the fact. In 2010, a picture surfaced of known Zodiac victim Darlene Ferrin and an unknown man who closely resembles the composite sketch. According to America's Most Wanted, police believe the photo was taken in San Francisco in the middle of either 1966 or 1967. In February 2014, it was reported that Louis Joseph Myers had confessed to a friend in 2001 that he was the Zodiac Killer after learning that he was dying from cirrhosis of the liver. This is interesting because there are several potential connections between Myers and the Zodiac case. Myers attended the same high schools as victims David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen and allegedly worked in the same restaurant as victim Darlene Ferrin. During the 1971 to 1973 period when no Zodiac letters were received, Myers was stationed overseas with the military. Myers apparently confessed that he targeted couples because he had had a bad breakup with a girlfriend. Now whilst officers associated with the case are sceptical, they believe the story is credible enough to investigate if more credible evidence does turn up. On October the 6th, 2021, the Case Breakers, an independent team of 40 former law enforcement investigators, military intelligence officers and journalists, claimed to have identified the Zodiac Killer as Gary Francis Post, but this information was not confirmed by the Vallejo Police Department. The Case Breakers have requested that police test the Zodiac Killer's DNA evidence to confirm it matches the DNA of Post. The police, however, said that the case is not solved and that the killer was not identified yet. The Zodiac Killer case remains open. We have no new information to share at this moment, an FBI spokesman said. Less likely subjects for the Zodiac Killer that have been put into the frame at one time or another include Ted Kaczynski, aka the Unabomber, and the Manson Murderous Society. In May 2018, the Vallejo Police Department announced their intention to attempt to collect the Zodiac Killer's DNA from the back of stamps he used during his correspondence. The analysis by a private laboratory was expected to check the DNA against a national database and it was hoped the Zodiac Killer may be caught in a similar fashion to the Golden State Killer. In May 2018, a Vallejo police detective said that the results were expected in several weeks, but here we are in May 2022 and no results have been reported yet. The FBI have stated that the case remains open, but that there is no new information to report. While local law enforcement expressed skepticism of the case breaker's evidence, Riverside Police Officer Ryan Railshack said that their claims largely relied on circumstantial evidence. Arthur Lee Allen Arthur Lee Allen, who died in 1992, was identified by Robert Gray Smith in his book Zodiac as a potential suspect based on circumstantial evidence. 
Alan had been interviewed by police from the early days of the Zodiac investigations and was the subject of several search warrants over a 20 year period. In 2007, Gray Smith noted that several police detectives described Alan as the most likely suspect. In 2010, Dave Toshi said that all the evidence against Alan ultimately turned out to be negative. However, his daughter in 2018 said her father had always thought Alan to be the killer but they did not have the evidence to prove it. At one point, Toshi himself had also said, as soon as that guy walked in the door, I knew it was him. He had a deep belief that Talon was the killer, but he never had a solid piece of evidence, so he had to keep investigating every other lead. In 1969, Alan was interviewed by the Vallejo Police Department. Alan had been reported in the vicinity of Lake Berryessa at the time of the attack against Hartnell and Shepard. However, he himself claimed to have been scuba diving at Salt Point on the day of the attacks. Alan again came to police attention in 1971 when his friend Donald Cheney reported to the Manhattan Beach Police in California that Alan had spoken of his desire to kill people, used the name Zodiac and secured a flashlight to a firearm for visibility at night. The conversation occurred no later than January 1969. Apparently, Allen had received an other than honourable discharge from the US Navy in 1958 and had been fired from his job as an elementary school teacher in March 1968 after allegations of sexual misconduct with students. He was generally well regarded by those that knew him, but he was also described as fixating on young children and angry at women. In September 1972, San Francisco police obtained a search warrant for Alan's residence. In 1974, Alan was arrested for sexually assaulting a 12-year-old boy. He pleaded guilty and served two years imprisonment. Vallejo police served another search warrant at Alan's residence in February 1991 and two days after Alan's death in 1992, they served another warrant and seized property from Alan's residence. In July 1992, victim Mike McGo identified Alan as the man who shot him in 1969 from a photo lineup, saying, That's him. That's the man who shot me. However, police officer Donald Folk, who is speculated to have seen the Zodiac fleeing from the same killing, said in 2007 that Alan weighed about 100 pounds more than the man he saw, adding that his face was also too round. Nancy Slover, who received the call from the Zodiac in the aftermath of the Miguel Ferrin shooting, said that Alan did not sound like the man on the phone. Other evidence does exist relating to Alan, albeit entirely circumstantial. A letter sent to the Riverside Police Department from Bates Killer was typed with a royal typewriter with an elite type font, the same brand found during the February 1991 search of Alan's residence. He owned and wore a Zodiac brand wristwatch. He lived in Vallejo and worked minutes away from where one of the Zodiac victims, Ferrin, lived and from where one of the killings took place. In 2002, the SFPD developed a partial DNA profile from the saliva on stamps and envelopes on the Zodiac letters. The SFPD compared this partial DNA to the DNA of Arthur Lee Allen. A DNA comparison was also made with the DNA of Don Cheney who was Alan's former close friend and the first person to suggest Alan may be the Zodiac killer. Neither test result gave a positive match. Alan and Cheney were excluded as the contributors of the DNA. Retired police handwriting expert Lloyd Cunningham, who worked on the Zodiac case for decades, stated, They gave me banana boxes full of Alan's writing, and none of his writing even came close to the Zodiac, nor did DNA extracted from the envelopes from the Zodiac letters. Next steps, so where do things progress from here? Well, it's unlikely that any more direct evidence will turn up after so long, although if people continue to look, inevitably they will find circumstantial evidence connecting people to the murders. However, at this point, you'd have to surmise that such evidence would really be more of a coincidence than anything more concrete. The best bet is that a match turns up on the national DNA databases at this stage, the murderer has surely died, so the match would come from one of his relatives. It would then take some additional detective work to identify the actual suspect and to be able to place them in the vicinity of the crimes or connect them to the Zodiac clues. What about the bits of the Zodiac clues that still remain undeciphered? Well, there is definitely a possibility that they lead somewhere. Have a go yourself. Decipher them. Who knows, you might just reveal a name. And if you do, please let us know.
Well, that's it on this subject. And if you've liked the video, please hit that like button. And if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, then you won't miss out on any future videos. Bye for now.